Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luden here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's episode. Excited about what is going to be a second episode of a, of a new uh, series here, yet to be named, a uh, new project here at Supply Chain Now, where really our frank conversation is going to be focusing on a deep dive into one singular topic rather than you know one particular individual's journey or uh, the business of the day or other things. So this is really going to be a really cool discussion here today. Um, I want to bring in our two panelists and then we'll talk about what we're going to be talking about here today. So uh, love our repeat guests. And on this show, we get we get a couple of them. Uh, first up, we're welcoming Google A2 Hughes back to the show. Uh, Hughes, how you doing? I'm doing great, Scott. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Great to have you back. Uh, of course, you serve as founder of Clinch, and you also, I reference your repeat guest, you can find uh, a great conversation on Hughes' journey on podcast episode number 634 here at Supply Chain Now. So Hughes, great to have you back. Um, and we've got Kelly Barner, of course, a host of Dial P for Procurement, owner at Buyers Meeting Point, uh, friend, compadre, you name it. Kelly, how you doing? I'm doing good, Scott. I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm super excited to be meeting Hughes face to face for the first time. Well, you know, and that is the one of the best parts of these, you know, um, to be able to serve as connectors of topics, the conversations, these episodes to serve as connectors and and, and get talented individuals and business leaders to uh, uh, rub elbows and collaborate and talk about some of the really uh, topics of our day, really, and that Hughes and Kelly leads us to talk about. Just what the heck are we going to talk about here today? So it's a bit unique, folks. So to our listeners, this is going to be the first time we've really de dedicated an episode here at Supply Chain Now, at least, on the business of art, the business of art. And I would add, you know, our team and panel here, really the way we look at the, view, uh, the world, perhaps, is we subscribe to the premise that there is truly a supply chain behind everything. So we're going to touch on supply chain behind art as well, but really focus on the business of art from a variety of perspectives. So to get us started, Hughes and Kelly, let's kind of find out, um, you know, why talk about art here today? So when we threw this topic out to Hughes uh, through some uh, conversations after his last appearance, you know, the business of art was kind of one of those things on the short list of topics that he really you know wanted to, to dive into here today. So Hughes, tell us. Why, you know, why did this appeal to you? Well, thank you, Scott, uh, for having me again. Um, the business of art, I think it's, it's um, we've, you've termed it correctly, the business of art, because most people, they do not really view art as a business or do not understand the business behind art. It's normally seen as a creative output, uh, just meant for creatives, but, um, and, and hopefully during this session, we'll be able to educate our listeners uh, or inspire some to get into the business of art or know more about what really drives the business of art. Obviously, we're going to dive deep into uh, the certain events that um, have formed the business of art, what's happening um, and so forth. So it's it's going to be more educational, really, hopefully, to, to, to teach our audience uh, about what's really happening behind the scenes, behind the paintings that they see, that there's a massive business that's happening there, which is lucrative. Um, hopefully, we're going to inspire a lot of people from this topic and educate more people even. I love that uh, because there is a lot more uh, uh, behind those gorgeous works of, of paintings and, and sculptures and, and much more. The business behind it drives the world of art for sure. So well said there, Hughes. All right, so Kelly, before we dive in, what else would you add here? So I think what I would add, and, and knowing the listening audience for Supply Chain Now, let me just speak directly to you. You're probably more comfortable with the business part than the art part. Um, and so here's sort of a couple of things to listen for through everything that Hughes and I and Scott, of course, discussed today. 
My friend Phil Eidson at Art of Procurement talks about the red thread. So there's two red threads I want you to listen for today, because these are the things that are going to come up in this conversation. They will actually apply to almost everything else you're doing in your business role. The first red thread is the concept of value. You know, we deal with this all the time. I'm in procurement, so there's always this tension between savings and value. And I know the same thing exists in finance and operations and supply chain, right? So we're going to explore that concept. The other thing, which is a little bit trickier, we're all pushing to innovate and to create new solutions and break through boundaries. But right behind innovation often follows bad actors, crime, people mm. with bad intentions. You know, and so there's, there's, again, this connection between something that has been created for good, for business, to help people to achieve things. There's always going to be people out there, unfortunately, worldwide, looking to misuse that. And so it's always something to think through. Always is. Every day is exciting uh, for good and for bad sometimes. <laughs> and in fact, you know, Hughes and Kelly were recording this session on the heels of what many claim to be the, the largest ransomware attack in the history right. of, of, of the business world. So um, and that illustrates your point uh, precisely, I think, Kelly. All right, but we'll save that for another day. Today is about the business of art as uh, the table has been set by Hughes and by Kelly here. All right, so I want to talk about as we lead off, right, in this first segment, we're really going to tackle today's conversation in three segments. Up front, it's kind of where supply chain, logistics, and the fine art world collide, at least where they intersect. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a nice traffic cop there where all three of those <laughs> big, big uh, segments uh, intersect. So Hughes, first question comes for you. You know, we've learned about free ports for this discussion, free ports. Uh, so to bring the audience up to speed, can you, can you describe what they are, what free ports are, and maybe give some examples of where they're located? Um, okay, thank you, Scott. So originally free ports were um, warehouses in, in, in free trade areas that were basically meant for uh, to store goods that will be in transit. So, but over the years, um, we have seen um, uh, a, a rise globally of, of, of a number of countries that have got uh, these free ports. You will find them in airports or in marine ports. That's where you'll find the most already we're taking logistics there in terms of, of uh, the positioning of, of the free ports. Uh, the biggest benefit that's coming from uh, from the free ports is that um, the people who store their goods in their business who store their goods in their uh, they don't get to pay any import duty and taxes that are associated with that so, so low taxes a, right low, low taxes. taxes low to no taxes I mean there's very minimum documentation that happens there it's it's literally a, that that's why it's attractive to uh, most people who are in the business of art uh, or other collectibles or other treasures uh, because, I mean, you, you, you don't really get to pay any tax and still you get to maintain an element of, um, there's an element of secrecy or privacy to the dealings that happen because it's not in the uh, forefront of everyone. There's literally almost no paper trail in terms of who owns this, who owns that piece. So that's the major aspect of, of reports. Um, there's quite a number. The most popular free port is the Geneva free ports um, that we all know Switzerland, it's a, it's a financial hub. So it, it comes as no surprise that you've got the, we've got the biggest free port there and you know, it's backed by the Swiss government. Uh, there is other private uh, shareholders to, to, to that. Um, there's the Luxembourg uh, free port also, which is in Europe. It's one of the biggest, also massive. Uh, I'd say to be the size of um, three football fields. Uh, it's wow. got enough, yeah, it's got enough space to store up to 750,000 bottles of wine. Um, just the setting, the building on its own, it, 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 it's, 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 it's in, immaculate. Um, but inside there, that's where you, you find all the treasures, all the collectibles. Um, and then we've got them in the US, I'm sure you already know you've got the, the, the Delaware Freeport um, in, in New York. And interestingly, the founder of the Delaware uh, Freeport is, um, he is originally a, a logistics uh, expert because he's the founder of um, 
what is it called? It's called Fritz, Fritz uh, International Logistics. So he's the founder of that. Um, we've got um, the Freeport in Singapore, um, which is also big and it's, it's almost co-owned by the same people on the Freeports in, in, in Luxembourg. And then we've got Hong Kong and China and so forth. So there's quite a number of, of, of Freeports um, that are very common and popular with, with, with big businesses that are in the business of uh, you know, storing their treasures in those places and obviously paying less tax. That's, that is a wonderful primer. I really appreciate that, Hughes, because it sets the table effectively. So three things before I, I uh, want to bring Kelly in. Um, you know, number one, it really is, illustrates the global aspect, the global, it, all countries, many countries use this, uh, these tax incentives to, 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 to um, motivate business and, and owners and, and, and economic activity, right? I think, um, um, secondly, you know, there's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot of things, a lot of um, expected outcomes that go into how we leverage taxes. And then as, as Kelly's going to touch on perhaps in a moment, there's a lot of unexpected outcomes. Um, and then thirdly, and, and we won't dive into this for this conversation, but we'll touch on it because when we, when we think of taxes and all these governments um, that uh, apply taxes to try to um, motivate and incentivize businesses, you know, of course, enterprises, global enterprises are going to try to maximize that and leverage it to figure out where they, they place operations, which, has given way to uh, these conversations around an established global tax that that, that uh, governments can get behind, which may shift some of that leverage over to the the, the government side. We'll see. All that's in play, but it really it's um, he's, the notion of the free ports and what's behind it is an age old global practice um, that impacts the art uh, industries and many others. But Kelly, so we're welcome into your commentary there. But but definitely we wanted we want to understand from from your research you know kind of how what free ports were designed for mm -hmm. versus some of the ways that maybe they're being used absolutely so and i think hughes gave a great primer and actually kudos hughes because i didn't know about pre free ports prior to, to researching for this conversation i think what's interesting to me about them is you have a couple of things um, and i'll actually refer to another friend here kate vitasic who's part of the vested program she often talks about perverse incentives, right? And so what she talks about with that is something that is done for a good reason that ends up unintentionally motivating an undesirable behavior. And I actually hear two perverse incentives in Q's description. The first one that I hear is tax avoidance, right? I mean, that is a huge incentive when you think about the value of these pieces of art. And then the second one is no paperwork. So in some ways, it's like this art isn't really in the country that it's physically in. And that's partially by design. You know, the intent of these free ports was that it was supposed to be possible for people to move expensive artworks safely and securely around the globe without having to incur tariffs and transfer fees and taxes in every single step of the journey, which makes sense. Right, because by the time you get it to its destination, you've eaten a significant portion of its value paying all of these fees along the way. Uh, but the problem with that is that it gives people a reason to leave art in the free ports in order to avoid inheritance taxes. Because there's no paperwork, it becomes a way to transfer ownership under the radar. Um, and the fact of the matter is, even the people operating these free ports don't necessarily know what's in them. And to my knowledge, Hughes, you're, you're welcome to jump in on this, but I didn't necessarily find any regulations around how long art can stay in a free port. It's meant to be a stopover. It's meant to be, you know, catch this ship, catch that ship in and out, air flights, right? How they're moving things around. But in some cases, according to my reading, a lot of this artwork ends up sort of living its life at least under the current owner in, in the Freeport, which is not really the intent, um, but that's not specified. Um, have you read anything, Hughes, or have come across anything that you know, suggests that there are either time limits in place or that countries or specific Freeports are trying to put time limits in place? 
Um, yeah, like what's happening is that, uh, like you said, originally free ports were meant to to stimulate, I mean, economic activity. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of cases that we can um, refer to where it really works well in terms of stimulating activity. You can look at the manufacturing industry if you can bring in components into a free port and you're not uh, paying any tax. And then, I mean, for value addition to what you already have in there, that on its own, you know, it, it stimulates economic activity. That's one of the biggest benefits. Then over the years, um, most businesses, banks included, hedge funds included, they have realized that um, the concept of free ports, it's a, it's a, and, and, and I'm linking it to fine art. It's a, it's a good thing to add to one's diverse investment portfolio. Absolutely. So now it gets to a point where the free ports really do not care for how long you keep your, 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 your piece of art there. And that's where you then begin to encounter the, the perverse behavior, like you put it, yeah. um, where people are actually keeping their, their stuff there for the purposes of, of, of tax avoidance or tying their capital in, in those pieces of art and other collectibles. And, and really no one can really trace because there's, there's no traceability, there's no paperwork. Yeah. So that's what's happening now because we've, we've had now corporates that are and, and rich individuals, you will see that some of the biggest or, or uh, collectors of art, it's, it's, it's very rich people. They've got um, collections worth three point, I think the top guys, three billion US dollars worth of, of art pieces. Wow. Um, yes, in, 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 in the Geneva Freeports. Um, so that's where the rich people are really keeping their money and I mean, they're notorious for, yeah. for, for tax avoidance and so forth. Um, so that's what he has really transformed the, the free ports industry to an extent that um, I think sometime in 2019 in the European Union, um, the, the, there is a report, I think a 48 page report about fraud and, and so forth in the free ports to an extent that they, they really want to do away with free ports as a whole because mm -hmm. they feel like they are not gaining much instead because you've got per perverse behavior now people are benefiting uh, and really not giving back to the state as it were because everyone has got an obligation to at the end of the day submit their tax returns some folks um, will, will take advantage uh, of, of yeah, any uh, tax yeah. mechanism right I think yeah. as as three entrepreneurs here, I think, I think we can we can agree to a person that we like to mitigate. We, we like tax <laughs> mitigation strategies, right? Yeah. However, yeah. as Hughes is suggesting, some folks are really taking that to a um, a whole new level. So yeah. we'll leave that for later discussion. But Kelly, uh, I, I know you had a couple other points when it, as it relates to free ports, right? Absolutely. And, and one of the things again, Hughes actually refers right back to to what you said. You know, we've talked about the fact that. Uh, these are sort of locations outside of locations, right? They are located in cities and countries and typically in port cities, but they are not of that country or, or city. And yet the government does play a role here because they have to be willing to allow this territory to be sort of outside of the tax system, outside of the regulatory system, outside of the paperwork system. Um, and yet one of the things I instantly thought about reading this information against the backdrop of what we see going on in the world is I thought to myself, okay, well, if I owned a Mona Lisa, which I'm frankly relieved that I don't because that's too much responsibility for me. Uh, but if I owned a Mona Lisa, I would be freaking out right now if it was in the Freeport in Hong Kong, because as China increasingly asserts its authority over Hong Kong, people that are storing their art who specifically chose Hong Kong because it was a freer location in the region where they had more confidence around democratic values and, and access to property. You know, it makes you wonder how are these people that are deciding where to keep their, their expensive property, if you do have your things in a free port, how closely are you watching the government activity that goes on in that area, in that region? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on the roles of governments with regard to any one of these specific free ports that we've talked about? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good point that you're making and question. And I think one of the major motivators for, for one to decide where to store um, their 
piece of art in a particular um, free port. It's, it's the um, political and social stability. Mm -hmm. First things first, because um, I mean, primarily the main reason why people still um, take their pieces to free ports is, is one, obviously we've already said that for, you don't pay any import tariffs. And then what comes then after that is the element of security. These free ports, there's maximum security that, you know, fireproof and waterproof and everything. So it's, it's the security that's there. So now you've got the added layer of, of that political stability that's required. Obviously for years, Hong Kong is an autonomous region of China. It's, it's always been a free port. Um, and I mean, it's, I think it's top eight of, of the world's trade centers. So obviously with, with what's happening in China, it's, it's a big cause of concern for, for, for the people that have got their collectibles or treasures stored there in Hong Kong. Um, and funny enough, China is, is actually in the south of China. They're busy building a, a massive free port oh there <laughs> that's due to open in 2025. Yeah. So, you know, obviously they see the value in that. And obviously there's all these tensions between Hong Kong and, and China and so forth. And, and I mean, personally for me, uh, if, if I were to, to store my piece of art, I wouldn't choose uh, Hong Kong uh, because of, of the... Yeah potential hostilities with China and, and you know, not consistent um, um, social stability. Yeah. Well, and, and, a, and a very interesting and relevant um, sidebar here is, as we've seen in the last uh, year or so, as supply chains uh, re-examine their presence in across China, you know, one of the many considerations, kind of to your point, Hughes, and, and Kelly, yours as well, is, is um, in some cases, there's been a threat of the government takeover uh, and, and um, um, I say takeover, there's a different word I'm looking for, but basically they um, assume the operations and the infrastructure of, of, of some companies, you know, based on decisions they make. And, and that's a threat that exists in China, uh, according to many, many reports. And that's one of the things that global business leaders are, are examining out of many, many considerations as they, as they re-examine where their footprint should be. So, um, I want to. Um, we, we should acknowledge the free ports that that are that exist in uh, you know some of the crisis torn countries. Kelly, I think as you put it, Syria, Iraq, Libya, and many others. Um, but but I want to move forward to the role of logistics and warehousing providers on uh, when it comes to fine art. So Kelly, I want to get you to start there, and then we'll circle back to Hughes. Well, and a little bit, this has to do with the conversation we were just having about government, right? So to a certain extent, a company, whether warehousing or logistics, is beholden to its ownership team, its shareholders, its customers, its employees, right? But it doesn't necessarily know the intentions or the motivations of any client that passes anything through the system. So I would imagine that as something like this becomes more complicated, becomes more discussed, questions are gonna to start to arise around what is the obligation of these companies to know what's inside the box, right? I mean, you can have a massive sealed up box that has nothing interesting on the outside, no details about what's inside it. And on paper, that warehousing provider or that logistics provider is only required to keep it safe meet you know, temperature and, and altitude requirements, um, pick it up at the right time, store it in the right place, drop it off at the right time undamaged. Um, but as we know, there are probably pieces of art that do not belong to the person shipping them, passing through some of these free ports, and then ultimately going through the supply chain and being handled by logistics providers, sitting in regular warehouses, simply because they've had this opportunity uh, to sort of be laundered if you will, once they go through a free port because of the lack of paperwork, they can come out on the other side. And in some ways, at least if you're willing to accept the risk associated with more traditional logistics and supply chain transport, uh, you can move it as if it's nothing of value passing through the supply chain versus some priceless piece of art that may or may not belong to you. Mm. And I think as these logistics providers, and again, people building warehouses, function in different jurisdictions by government, 
knowing what those regulations are in each place, knowing the legal obligation, where's the burden of proof, where's the obligation around ensuring you don't have stolen goods moving through your supply chain. Um, you know, it would be interesting if at some point logistics providers were somehow held to the same account as, you know, pawnbrokers, right? You have a responsibility to ensure that you have a legitimate item that you're holding and then reselling. You have a responsibility to ensure you're not helping fence stolen goods. You know, where logistics are dealing with predominantly packaged things, that's a little bit harder because you don't necessarily know what's inside the box um, and you don't necessarily have a right to open that box and check. So it's a very sticky issue. Love that. And Hughes, I'm going to come to you next, but one quick sidebar. You know, it's interesting when we think of um, the loss of cargo, the loss of containers, uh, the ransomware attacks we mentioned earlier. I'd say one of the biggest ripples that is currently going through global business is the insurance sector behind yes. all these things. We'll save that for a later show, but that's one of the things that oftentimes isn't thought about as we look to you know, kind of keep arm's length when it comes to liability. And and when that arm's length isn't there, you, you know, you, you lean on your, your insurance partners, but Hughes going back to um, the responsibility of logistics and warehouse providers, what are your thoughts there? Um, yeah, I think uh, Katie has made such a, a great point there. I mean, especially now, more than ever, where we live, where we're talking every day about the need for visibility in our supply chain. Um, almost everyone in our global community has an understanding that without visibility, really, we're not going to, to, to achieve much, you know, in terms of, because it, it's, it's got a, a, a net effect on almost everything. The world is a supply chain. Um, I remember once we had a conversation with Enrique uh, and we were talking about, you know, child labor and cobalt trans, uh, transportation from the DRC. And he asked one good question that, why are these transporters not asking what's contained in that? You know, it, it's, it's, it's one thing transporting an item from point A to B, but, you know, it's another asking now, what is it that I'm transporting? What's inside there? So I think it's a matter of, of regulations, it's, it's, it's high time that we rethink um, the whole idea of Freeport so that there is an element of transparency, there is an, an element of visibility, because there's so many things that are being hidden in that supply chain alone, you never really know what's inside. I mean, it, 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 it could be anything, it could be illegal stuff, it could be stolen stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and what makes matters worse is when these things get into the free post where there is minimal declaration, it's itself, in terms of the value, it's self-declaration, I can say to you know, the item that's here, it's, it's just worth um, 1 million US dollars. Meanwhile, that item is worth 5 million US dollars. So it's self-declaration, no one is questioning anyone. Um, because there's no paper trail, that's how these free ports have been created. But to go back to the issue of logistics, I think with all transactions that happen in trade, um, logistics is the center of that because ultimately you have to move an item from point one to point B. When we, we talk about import tariffs, we're talking about logistics. When we talk about free ports, as it were, it's warehouses, uh, that's logistics on its own. And, and I think um, to a greater extent, the, the, the governments of the world need to rethink the regulations so that we, we achieve more visibility whilst ensuring that um, there's still beneficiation coming from, from uh, the continued operation of, of these free ports. There was a case in, in, um, in the Geneva free ports a couple of years ago, the Italian cops, they, they, they did suspect that there was something, some stolen pieces fine art pieces and, and, and uh, from Italy, they suspected that they were in, in the Geneva Freeports and um, they applied to get access. They eventually granted access. And when they went into the Freeports, they, they found 48 crates, you know, with, with, with uh, uh, antiques, antiques that were stolen from Italy. Wow. So that's a big supply chain problem. Exactly what we're talking about right now, that there is no visibility. So you've got people like in, in crisis torn areas like, like Syria, Libya, they've got their own, uh, you know, uh, cultural and artifacts and art that get stolen and no one really knows where those items end up in. But meanwhile, those items exactly where they are, is they're in the free ports. Like uh, Katie said earlier, now there's no cap in terms of 
of how long can keep this year. It can stay there for 20 years or so. Mm. Sales can happen virtually, literally, like uh, um, you can go to, to the free port and, and have uh, make a sale there, conclude it there. Yeah. You don't have ownership of that. There's no traceability that you ever owned that item. Right. So we really need to rethink that process. Well, Sunshine cures lots of things and it whether it is supply chain and some of the, the major issues and challenges of the day that, um, that supply chain leaders are being charged with in, in often uh, in, in many cases, leading the response and leading the efforts to eradicate um, some things you've touched on now and in, in, in previous uh, episodes use uh, or government, of course, uh, my belief, at least um, we, we have to have the visibility, have to have the sunshine, have to have to use that spotlight uh, to first be aware of, of some of these transgressions um, and some of these um, actions that, that uh, companies, leaders and, and others should not be able to get away with. So that, that might sound simplistic to some to me. It's it's uh, it it helps make the corrective actions to these challenges easier to digest, right? How do you, you know, it's that proverbial bite of the elephant. And we've got to apply that in some of these massive uh, challenges that we're faced with, whether you're in supply chain or not. All right. So on a much lighter note, right? In this first opening segment, gosh, we dove deep in this first segment. <laughs> we'll talk about art napping, art napping. No, that's not a picture for the New York Yankees from the 1920s. That is a... <laughs> Uh, that's another word for uh, the art, the heist of artwork, right? Art theft. So can y'all believe this? It's been estimated that only 10% of stolen art is ever recovered. As we talked pre-show, I would my, my take on that is probably uh, officially recovered, but there's plenty of other that it's been recovered. It's just hanging in someone's wall and, and they're not going to say where they got the, the world's greatest deal. Um, the largest art theft, Kelly, on record. And I say Kelly because this is this is connected to you up in your neck of the woods. So Hughes Kelly in 1990, 13, just 13 works of art worth some five hundred million dollars. Holy cow, mm -hmm. was stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum up in Boston. That case remains officially at least unsolved. Kelly, you might have an additional point or two to add to that. I do actually have an additional point. And, and first of all, this is for maybe the last person in the supply chain now listening audience that has not yet heard me say I'm from Boston. I'm from Boston. Very proud of it as well. Um, so the interesting thing about this is that obviously this crime has been investigated and investigated and investigated. There have been leads that have gone cold. A lot of years have gone by. There's some question marks about the security guard that was working that night. But to the value of one of the things we're actually going to start talking about, how has Isabella Stewart Gardner handled the theft from a business perspective? So obviously there's the insurance implications, there are the criminal investigations that are going on. From a business perspective, I actually think they've been incredibly clever. So for anybody that has not visited Isabella Stewart Gardner, it's a very quirky museum. The, the art in it is breathtaking and amazing but it basically is Isabella Stewart Gardner's house in downtown Boston. She was a very wealthy woman who bought up all this artwork and hung it sort of eclectic crazy in her house. But what they did is for all the paintings that were stolen, they left the empty frames. The museum to this day has left the empty frames hanging. So you can see, and it's from one particular room where the majority of the paintings were stolen. You go into that room and there are empty frames hanging on the walls. There are uh, pictures of what had originally hung there. There is documentation about the story. And so from a business perspective, they've used the truth of what happened as unfortunate as it is to add to their story, to their cultural value to the city of Boston and as a draw, frankly, to tourists because that's a pretty unique thing to go into right. an art museum and have them say like, hey, you know, this is where all of our stolen stuff is supposed to be. It does create a little bit of competitive advantage. I yes. Think. I hear the X-Files theme sing, uh, <laughs> playing in the background, but also Hughes, I bet old Isabella found a way to avoid a few taxes back in her day. It's my hunch. Um, but let's, let's, let's move forward. Cause I want to talk about as Kelly referenced uh, in this next segment, we're going to be talking about Banksy. Is it genius or, or a vandal? So this should elicit some interesting takes. So first off, let's make sure everyone knows who we're, 
you know, what we're talking about. So Banksy is really a pseudonym for an English-based street artist and activist. Of course, it kind of depends on your, your definition. But he or she has become famous, really legendary, for their street art and or graffiti. Kind of depends on your take, too. And I say I say he, I maybe should say he or she, but, but there's been several folks that have um, – have come close or maybe even that have identified Banksy as um, an, an Englishman. Uh, and we'll, we'll save that for a later conversation. But uh, Kelly, this was your addition to this conversation around the business of art. Why? Why does Banksy appear here on Supply Chain Now? So he appears here for two reasons. One is that topic of value again that, that we'll get around to. But the other reason is one of the things that's unique about Banksy is the vast majority of his artworks uh, they just appear in the night. And so, for instance, one of the more recent new artworks that appeared, I believe it's called The Sneeze. It's a woman sneezing painted on the side of a home in a small British town. It's, it's an older stone-based house. And one morning, that town woke up and it was validated as being a Banksy. It's a woman sneezing painted on the side of this house odd subject matter, I don't know. Um, but here's the interesting thing about that, again, from a business perspective, that house had just sold. The paperwork had gone through. Ooh. Now they wake up and there's a Banksy on the side of it. Oh yes, those owners found a way to get out of that purchase and sale agreement because now the value of the house, whether you consider this graffiti or whether you consider it an installation artwork, it has significantly changed. And yet they didn't consent to the art going there. Banksy didn't own the house that we know of, right? And so he's taking other people's property and materially changing the value of owning it sort of without anybody's permission. So he's definitely a high profile artist functioning outside of the boundaries that we would typically think of. That is, uh, it is fascinating on so many different levels. Um, Hughes, what would you add to this conversation, this first part about Banksy? What are the chances that you might be Banksy yourself, Scott? <laughs> uh, that's good. You, you know, when I read the, the story of Banksy, thanks for, 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 for bringing that up, Kelly. Um, it, it, it reminds me of, of um, the Bitcoin guy who is a known, Satoshi. Yes. So, you know, the, this element of, of privacy of this person not being known and existing, yeah. people derive value from that. Um, and when I was doing my research, I, I found an instance where sometime in 2013, Banksy went to, he went to New York. Um, he, he disguised himself as a, as, a, as a street vendor artist, set up a stall in Park Central, sold eight of his pieces for $60 each. The following night, he, he posted on the internet that um, last night, um, yesterday, I was in Park Central and I sold eight of my original art pieces. Then he just left it at that. A year later, one of the pieces that he had sold for $60 sold out in London for £54,250. Wow. <laughs> wow. Good investment. Yeah, good investment. So <laughs> that element of, of, of secrecy and privacy and, and, and you know, people derive value from that. And, and I think for me, I mean, I think it's genius, to be honest, I think it's genius. I mean, uh, he, he has mastered uh, what people find value in, you know, yeah. the, the whole idea of the unknown, people find value in that. That's an excellent point, Hughes. And, and if you just, to our listeners, if you just, if you're new to Banksy, um, or if you're not, you just throw it in Google and you can see some of the really um, beautiful and very savvy and thought provoking art. I mean, he, um, Banksy really has got a, there's a reason why he's developed such a reputation and why he can sell mm -hmm. paintings at 54,000 pounds. Holy cow. All right. Yeah. So moving right and, and, along. And, and so, sorry, Scott. And I think what's more interesting is that he, he doesn't limit himself to, to one particular area. He travels all over the world. I mean, even in the West Bank, right? his, his works there is all over the world. So he's not only limited to, to one place. So, I mean, that's that's quite interesting. I mean- Yes. If my son was part of the conversation, he, he'd be bringing up Batman. Uh, you know, it's his ability <laughs> to, to pop in and pop out and disappear 
you know, in, in, in thin air, it really, it, 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 this is a intriguing topic from a variety of fronts, um, from a, from a market front to a sheer tactics. And, and of course there's some mystique involved as well, but I want to talk about, um, more about ownership and Kelly getting you back involved here. Yeah. So who would you, uh, who owns Banksy's work? And we're going back to the house example. You meant, you mentioned, how does it change the lives of the people that own the structures or, or uh, own the artwork or, or own the structures that maybe that are selected for the works of art? I mean, you just mentioned the house example. What, uh, what, uh, what other thoughts do you have? Well, the interesting thing is, I mean, if you, if you own the structure that the painting is on, right, you do own the painting sort of by default, um, simply because you own the material that it's back to. Now, as we know, and, and Scott, we've also had multiple conversations about the concept of digital content ownership, which is a little bit more complicated, right? right? So if, if you own this painting because you own the house that it happens to have been painted on, and someone comes along in the middle of the night because it's pretty hard to defend the side of your house and paints over it, are you now entitled to damages? You know, is, is that a crime? Um, and one of the things that I actually hadn't thought about until now, Hughes, you know, we talk about the free ports and we talk about uh, sort of the devious power of anonymity is that who owns Banksy's identity? Right. One of the, the really interesting things that I learned about him, which brings us back to this concept of the business of art, is what is truly the difference between a trademark and a copyright? And because Banksy's work was starting to be sold for unbelievably high prices, he started sort of making a foray into this whole world of trying to legally protect some of his work. Now, he originally applied for a trademark to protect some of his work because you don't have to reveal your personal identity in order to earn a trademark. Companies can file for trademarks, right? It's a very common thing. He tried to take that concept and apply it to his art so that he could get what, what was in effect a copyright, but without revealing his identity. Interesting. And it did not work partially because the same social media that has allowed everyone around the world to realize that what they bought in New York is this incredibly valuable painting also has worked against him. He had made some very blunt statements about you know, being against copyrights on social media. And so when he applied for the trademark, the courts were able to say, you're clearly trying to, to kind of pull a fast one on us here. And they entered into evidence all of the things that he had said in the past about, about copyrights. And so in that case, not only would it have required a very unusual ruling, but also his own works, his own words kind of worked against him on that. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Hughes, any, any comments there? Um, yeah. I mean, for me, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I think Katie can advise. Yeah. Like maybe I'll pick your brain. Like, um, where exactly uh, Banksy get the, the value? Like, does he get value from uh, from being a viral internet figure? Like, for example, he sold a piece for, for, for 60 US dollars. Next a year after that piece is, is um, sold for 50,000 pounds, right? So, I mean, what's the benefit for him that does, does he, he, he get satisfaction from mm -hmm being this internet person that is unknown more he likes that anonymity more than the actual value that he can derive from his works of art like he goes into someone's house and just decides to make a painting they craft and then just leaves the owner of the house is the one who gains because the value instantly goes up so he's yeah. he told him to me his value he derives his value from um being that anonymous person more than the actual works of art or graffiti that he he, he embarks on well um so so much to tackle i i, I know we were going to talk about maybe the the role of the new news media plays and, and a few other aspects but i want to move forward into this third segment for the sake of time because this market for fake art and whether it's fake art or numerous other markets that have cropped up due to a variety of reasons real and otherwise right in the digital realm Talk about your fascinating uh, developments here in the last, um, or in, here in the information age. 
So Kelly, we just talked about, you know, art being in the eye of the beholder and owner, because mm-hmm. as some folks look at, at, at Banksy's work, they're works of art. And I got to tell you, I'm not a, um, I'm about as much of an artist or an art <laughs> expert as I am technologist, which is nothing is nothing. So, so Hughes, I am not Banksy. Let me just state that for all of our listening audience. Um, but you know, what about it when, when it's less perspective and more straight out forgery in terms of fake art, what do you say then Kelly? Well, and, and it's interesting because this is a story that has a tendency to crop up every time a forgery is detected. It sort of gets everyone's attention because there's there's almost like a movie story quality uh, mystique that goes along with this. And there have been a couple of recent forgeries that actually sold for enormous sums of money. And interestingly enough, when this does seem to happen or when it's alleged that it has happened, oftentimes people look back to the provenance of the painting or another way to look at it is what is the supply chain that brought that painting to that person what is the chain of ownership been and whose hands has it passed through to get to the auction where it's being sold now at least in the case of very high profile forgeries typically they are going through art houses or auction houses and so unlike the logistics providers that we've talked about that don't know what's in the box and aren't necessarily responsible for vouching for the validity of the contents of the package, art houses and auction houses do have a responsibility to make sure that what they're selling is actually what it's being billed at. Because in part, someone like Sotheby's making a claim that something is an original Van Gogh, right? Or is an original Da Vinci. That does add to the value. It adds to the esteem and to therefore to the price that that artwork can command. I mean, in recent years, even in the last, I mean, four, looking back here, we've had a known fake Mona Lisa sell for 3.4 million, which is 10 times its appraised value. Um, In November of 2017, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, he paid $450 million for what may be a fake Mona Lisa. Well, they call it the male Mona Lisa. It's a, a painting that's much like it. When you're talking about those amounts of money, the incentive that it creates to produce forgeries um, is unbelievable, but the news media and the attention that goes along with it, again, to Hugh's question about what is each person's perception of value, sometimes even once we find out a painting is a forgery, it still continues to have value because now it's the forgery that fooled the art house, that fooled the auctioneer, that managed to be auctioned off and as part of a news story. And that gives it a life of its own. And that gives it even investment value without being a legitimate and authentic work of art. Mm. So uh, moving right along, Hughes, I'd love to, to pose this next question to you because there's old fakes. And I, as I'll we'll touch on in a minute, you know, Faking art is nothing new. It's been around for uh, several centuries. Um, so the old fakes, you're done by apprentices. Mm-hmm. I, I think I said that right. Apprentices to the uh, legends of art history or, and even some of the non-legends. And this new commercially digital, uh, commercially incentivized um, forgeries that, that Kelly has touched on, whether they're digital or otherwise, right? Including, uh, you said it was, it was the ma- the male Mona Lisa. Is that what the you call it? Male Mona it? Lisa. Wow, yes. that's, a new, new, that's a new one for me. But Hughes, what what, did, what is your take on the differences between old and new here? Um, yeah, one one is a criminal act. The other really is it's not so much of a criminal act. So the legal implications differ between the two. A fake work of art, uh, basically, it's, it's, it's someone making a a painting. Um, they, it could be a copy of, of someone's work, but they still acknowledge that they have done this work. It's, that, that's you faking it. But then on the other hand, um, when you talk about forgery, that's literally fraud because you you do a, 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 a piece of, of art and then you you lie that, okay, Scott is the one who did this art because Scott normally gets, you give the, to the name of, the, of a known artist. So if Scott is a known prestigious artist, I do a, a piece of art and say, just sign Scott. That's forgery, that's fraud on its own. So the legal implications differ. The, the latter, it's, there's more um, legal impl- implications for that. But then, you know, you now have to, like, like uh, Katie said, art moves, um, the, the logistics behind it, it's, it's, it's massive. You, you might only realize 
at the maybe 20th cell of the of, of the piece of art that is actually fraud. This is this is not Scott who did this painting. Where is the provenance? Now we need to start going backwards and find out who was the source of this. It's, it's not an easy thing. So I think that's also causing the markets to be lucrative, like um, like Kelly said, people now derive value from that because now at the end of the day, you've got this piece of art, you're probably the 20th owner of the piece of art and you've paid obviously more than the other 19 people before you. What are you gonna do about it? There's just no way that you're going to discard it. Next thing you you, you have to, to sell it at an even higher price. Right. It keeps on moving, it becomes an, an, an element of value. What's really interesting about this, one of the many things interesting about when we talk about uh, forgeries is, um, you know, supply chain, global supply chains here in recent years and months uh, have, have all of a sudden found new advanced challenges when it comes to counterfeit and forgeries. And the art world's like, folks, <laughs> this is nothing new. <laughs> Welcome to our world, right? Yeah. Because they've been dealing for, with it forever. And as we've seen here just during the pandemic you know, masks that were counterfeits, um, and, and other healthcare equipment. Um, it, it's really, um, not much of the forgery and counterfeit market can be, you know, the threat is dollars, right? Lost business, but more and more, especially when it comes to healthcare, the challenge can be far riskier than that. And it could be a, 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 a true matter of life and death. So I love y'all's takes here. I love the, there's so many different supply chain elements and, um, dynamics that are transferable as we study art and the business of art. I want to close our conversation here today because I want to talk about, I want to make sure, well, before I do that, Kelly, this art as an investment versus cultural treasure, you know, up in the front, we talked about that uh, much earlier in the conversation. Um, I want to get, maybe get y'all both the way in there and then we'll, we'll close on, on a couple of historical notes when it comes to art forgery. So what, what's your take when we think about, that business investment, right? Yeah. That you were kind of talking about um, the, the Saudi Arabian um, monarchy uh, that have made those massive investments yeah. versus, you know, some of the, the art that countries around the world really protect and value as kind of a um, part of who they are. Absolutely. I mean, and part of this has to do with, you know, artwork is created as art or as social commentary, but it is not typically created as investment opportunity, even though it ends up functioning as that. It makes me terribly sad to think about the beautiful, interesting, surprising works of art that are languishing in these free ports that none of us are, are ever going to see, not because we can't travel to a specific museum in a specific country, but because no one can see them. They're, you know, they're all boxed in and created up. Um, but there's also a lot about artworks that can be seen where there's question about how they were removed from their points of origin. And again, back to this idea of ownership, somewhat like we explored with Banksy, you know, who in fact owns this and was it rightfully taken or moving from where it was? In fact, this morning, so it's early July as, as we're recording this, literally just this morning, it hit the Boston papers that Harvard University has a ceremonial tomahawk, I won't attempt to get the details right because I don't have the pronunciation in front of me, but it's a ceremonial tomahawk that ended up in the collections at Harvard University that they are returning or repatriating to the Native American tribe that it came from. It's a very significant cultural artifact. Is it art? Absolutely. Is it beautiful and interesting? Absolutely. And do we want people to see it and know what it is? 100%. But it's organizations like Harvard sending that back, or some of the conversations that are happening between say the British Museum and the country of Egypt about some of those antiquities that were moved in a different time under different values. What do we potentially need to do to maybe put some of those things back? Um, again, that brings ownership and investment right head to head because a lot of money has been spent preserving, protecting, displaying, transporting these artifacts um, you know, there are business implications of just handing them back, even if that is ultimately the culturally or the socially right thing to do. Mm. Um, Hughes, any comments, sir? Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with, with Kelly, like the, especially in the, the aspect of artifacts. There, there were 
uh, originally created, you know, it was part of the way of life of a particular people at a certain time. Unfortunately, some of these artifacts end up being in other countries. I think the British Museum is home of, of, of some of the most stolen artifacts in the world. They end up in the British Museum. Um, once they are in there, now there's an element of value begin to, to have that element of value there. But now we're seeing lots of, of um, NPOs and other organizations that are pushing for the repatriation of, of all these artifacts to their original countries. It's happening. Um, but again, there's that element of it because there have been some of these artifacts have been in the British Museum for, for years, decades and so forth. And you know they have been maintaining in, in terms of the conservation of those elements, which is a financial element on its own. So now, when they're returning them back, um, I mean, the, there is that element of value that kicks in, that element of finances that kicks in. Mm -hmm. You've got the element of logistics also that um, kicks in. Um, so I think what we would like to, I'd like to see more is, is um, more visibility also in that process of repatriation, really. Because in most instances, what we really get to know is that um, a certain artifact has been returned to Nigeria or to Egypt and so forth. But we we not really privy to the uh, technicalities behind that because really it has to be a state to state agreement for a country to agree for a particular artifact to be returned. And I mean, they've owned it for a particular time. They've taken care of it. They've incurred losses. Obviously, they've made money from it also from people maybe we're going to the museums to to view those um artifacts mm. so it's 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 a it's a hot debate really like we said it earlier when we started this conversation that element of visibility a little bit of sunshine will go a long way you know in ensuring that we kind of like all on the same page um, right with these things well and he's you know these national regional treasures you know, whether it's artwork whether it's um you know, cobalt, as we've talked about earlier, you, you name it, it's part of an ongoing discussion uh, to protect that and, and not to have, um, you know, certain individuals take advantage of that. And, and it applies in so many different aspects of, of global, global trade, global commerce, and here in, in the global art market and global art world. Um, I should add, interestingly enough, as um, you know, much of supply chain now programming is global, you know, global guests, global topics. Um, you know, certainly our, our global listenership, which we're very grateful for. Um, it always interested, and, and Hughes is, is dialed in. Hughes, you're dialed in in Johannesburg. Is that right? In yes, South Africa. That's correct. So it, it, mm -hmm. this dawned on me the other day. Uh, our family went down to St. Augustine last week, Hughes and Kelly, uh, which is in the States, the oldest city. And as I was talking to a Middle Eastern uh, friend of mine, uh, we were talking about this one fort that we visited. And, and I want to say the fort dates back to either 1532 or 1632 when it was um, in terms of the year that construction started. I'm going to get that wrong and I'm going to hear from people, but that's okay. But that is really old in like American years. <laughs> but right. As my friends across the pond, you know, point out that is, that's nothing. That, that is, that is a baby, you know, in terms of uh, overall uh, history. And that's always fun. It's, it's just a, it's an interesting natural perspective we has it as humans right you know what you touch every day and and you apply that to so much in terms of context and uh it's always fascinating to kind of call that out um okay speaking of history i want to i want to wrap on this uh first off well and i can't wrap on that and one more false start uh false finish i'm sorry kelly really quick yeah. we're going to talk about the use of blockchain to authenticate real art can you touch on that in a small nutshell Yes, very quickly. So one of the great things about blockchain, if you're familiar, is that because, uh, because each block in the chain contains the information of all of the blocks that preceded it, and they are typically hosted publicly, and any attempt to edit a block in the blockchain becomes part of the record, it is a more secure way of maintaining data where multiple parties are concerned with authenticity. So this is one of the applications that's sort of being explored. Of course, at some point, that blockchain has to be started, right? So there is always this, this point of contention around before we start tracking a piece of art through a blockchain, how certain are we that it is what we're saying it is and that we know where it's come from and who owned it? There's always going to be some place that it starts. But it's kind of an inter interesting meeting of two worlds. 
right, where we have one of our newest technologies that is still now being piloted and tested and applied for all kinds of different uses. And then this time old challenge of authenticating art and handling the valuation and the transfer of ownership appropriately. Um, so that will be an interesting thing to follow in the years to come to see if it becomes a common practice. Love that. I love best practices, new use case, new practical use cases of blockchain, because we're all after uh, confidence and authenticity in global supply chain, whether you're, whether that is art or whether that's it's, uh, um, masks or whether it's uh, your adult beverages that maybe you might be enjoying uh, each weekend. But regardless, that confidence in global supply yeah, chains. Just, just, to, just, to add to, just to add to that, Scott, just to add to what Kate mentioned about blockchain technology, I think the one of the best examples of blockchain that people can look into is the business case uses of Ethereum. Obviously, most people know it as a cryptocurrency, but it, it's, it's more of smart contracts. That's a big business case use example of, of, of blockchain. There are people that are using that in, in different industries and um, people will soon get an idea of what it, it means. You know, it basically is building a block on top of each other so that there's traceability. You always get to know the source. It started from this block and people have to agree. There has to be agreement for the next block to be added. So if anyone um, doesn't agree, it's not going to happen. So, you know, there's, there's visibility. Um, that element of agreeability also kicks into, into place. But I mean, the biggest benefit, I think, for supply chain use cases is the transparency that the blockchain technology uh, promises us. So I'm, I'm really interested to see how the world will take that up going forward. Excellent point. Uh, cause it, it, these are transformational times for sure, uh, from a global business, global supply chain standpoint, I appreciate both of your points on blockchain because that's, that's one of the thing, one of the, um, uh, elements that is truly making these transformational times. So, um, I want to wrap on this, uh, cause this last segment, we've been talking about art forgery. Well, again, it's nothing new. It dates back a couple thousand years now. Some folks point to the Renaissance as when it began, because that's when many painters began to take on these apprentices that we that we touched on earlier. And the apprentices, I'm not sure why that word is such a tough one for me to pronounce today, but it is. But uh, these apprentices were encouraged to study, copy, and produce art in their teacher's style, right? They, that was actually an encouraged practice. And then the teacher and mentor would sell that impersonated art and they'd keep much of that revenue. I and mean, this was established right, a couple thousand years ago. But if you fast forward hundreds of years, almost two centuries, you know, sometimes these forgers uh, that, that came about because of outright forgery, right? They became more well-known and became some, in some cases more in demand than the original painters and artists. Here's a neat example, Kelly. So if, for fake, right? Orson, Orson Wells, right? Kind of similar to that dial P for procurement. Um, so uh, one prominent art forger was fe was featured in this Orson Wells picture called Elmire de Ori. Now, I, I think I came really close to making that. Well, his forgeries became so popular that they began to appear on the global art market. And that's just one example. You never know. You know, it's, it's all in the eye of the beholder oftentimes, and, and those eyes of those beholders is what drives these global markets for good or for bad, as we've talked, we've touched on here throughout today's conversation. Okay, for as much as we talked about, there's so much we didn't talk about. We'll have to save that for a later episode. But uh, starting with Hughes, Hughes, I uh, really enjoyed your perspective and expertise you shared here today. Um, really enjoyed our last episode where we kind of focus more on your journey. Again, that's episode number 634 at Supply Chain Now. But how can folks connect with you and, and compare notes and, and who knows, maybe collaborate with you? Oh, talking about collaboration, you know, my email is collaborate at clinch.co.za. Uh, <laughs> um, that's all that I'm about. You know, I'm open to collaboration, um, but otherwise uh, my Twitter angle is the real process and I'm very active on, on Twitter. So that's where uh, folks uh, can reach me. Wonderful. I love that. And I love your 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 uh, authentic approach to Twitter, right? Uh, you, you, you tell it like it is. And we need more of that in global business and across social media. 
Um, okay, Kelly, same question to you. You know, beyond, you know, folks can find you here at Supply Chain Now. Is it every third Tuesday at 12 noon? I get that right? It is every third Tuesday at 12 noon. 12 noon Eastern time for oh, Dial P yes. for Procurement, where the, the, the leaders of the global procurement community get together uh, and talk about some of the, the issues of our day. But how else can they connect with you, Kelly? Absolutely. So it's very easy to find me on LinkedIn as Kelly and to find me on Twitter as Buyers Meeting Point. And the handle is actually Buyers Meet, M-E-E-T, Point. Um, find me in either of those places. I'm very much looking forward to reading the comments that we get in response to this. So I'm going to be eagerly looking forward to that and hopefully having discussions with everybody who has listened in or watched the video of this conversation on one of the social media platforms. Love it. Uh, really have enjoyed today's conversation. Big thanks to Kelly Barner with Buyer's Meeting Point. Big thanks to Google A2 Hughes with Clinch. Uh, we look forward to having you all both back again soon. And to our listeners, hopefully you've enjoyed this very uh, unique episode at Supply Chain Now, the business of art. And, and I'll tell you, the deeper we dove, uh, the more we, we, we need to cover, maybe on some future episodes, we'll, we'll, we'll have to circle back on that. But most importantly, folks, uh, if you enjoyed today's episode, you can find a lot more uh, conversations with the leaders across global supply chain at supplychainnow.com. Find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. But most, most importantly is, hey, on behalf of our entire team here, do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time right here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now.